I'm Morgan Jorgensen, the Donor Relations and Events Manager for the Truman Library Institute. Welcome to Truman and Eisenhower, President of the Heartland. This is the latest installment in our series of digital programming commemorating the 75th anniversary of Truman's presidency. Tonight, we're joined by Sam Ruscha, Supervisory Archivist at the Harry S. Truman Library and Museum, and Tim Reed, Deputy Director of the Eisenhower Presidential Library, Museum, and Boy and Home, who will share stories from the lives and presidencies of Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower. Sam and Tim, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. The hour long presentation. There will be a 10 to 15 minute QA session. Questions can be submitted during and immediately following the remarks via the QA feature at the bottom of your screen. Now, it is my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Sam Ruscha. Okay. Thank you, Morgan, and good evening, everyone. Uh, if we can proceed to the next slide, please. Great. Harry S. Truman was a president of the heartland. Uh, but what does it mean to say that he was a president of the heartland? Uh, here I'm referring to his, his what Midwestern values, hard work, patriotism, honesty, duty, and integrity. Now those values are not exclusively Midwestern, of course, but they do reflect Harry Truman's personality and character. This evening I will only have time to talk about some of the highlights of Truman's life and career and I'm looking forward to uh, talking with Tim about his connections with, with uh, another president of the Heartland, Dwight Eisenhower. So if we can move on to the next uh, slide, please. This is a photograph of Harry Truman as a young boy. He's in the first grade in Nolan School in Independence. This picture was probably taken in around uh, 1890. Uh, Harry Truman was born on May 8, 1884, in the town of Lamar, Missouri, which is about two hours south of Kansas City. And it, at age six, uh, his parents moved to Independence. Uh, his mother was interested in him attending public schools in Independence, Missouri. So. This picture would have been taken probably very soon after his return or his move to independence. That's him in the front row on the far right. You see the little arrow indicating uh, his, his location there in the picture. Yeah, Harry Truman was an avid reader as a child, in part because of his poor eyesight, which prevented him from engaging in, in the kind of uh, schoolyard games that a lot of his peers did. And so he was fitted with eyeglasses as a young boy. And that kind of set him apart from some of his uh, other fellow students. He read history and biography and was a lifelong learner. He also read the, the Bible quite a bit. He wore eyeglasses and took piano lessons. Uh, and, uh, but otherwise, he was a, a, an average boy. He had two siblings. He had a brother and a sister. And by all indications, by his own accounts and his own memoirs, he had a happy childhood. Okay, go to the next slide, uh, please, Morgan. Okay. This picture is taken of Harry Truman when he was probably about 14 years old, about the time that he had his first job at Clinton's drugstore in Independence, where he swept the, swept the floor and, and cleaned bottles um, and uh, really learned what it was like to, to work. Um, as a young, uh, young man, he was close to his cousins, the, the Nolan sisters who lived across the street from what would become his future home in Independence at 219 North Delaware, which we'll say more about later. Uh, at a young age, he struck up a friendship with Bess Wallace, uh, who was a, a longtime native of, of Independence, well, lifelong native of Independence. They had met in Sunday school when, uh, when uh, Harry was in the second grade. They came from different backgrounds, though, and that's kind of important, uh, different economic backgrounds, and Bess was considered part of the, the, uh, the local elite. Uh, she was an Episcopalian with a long-standing roots in independence. Uh, Harry Truman himself was a Baptist. Bess's grandfather had been a prominent businessman. Okay, uh, next slide, please. This is a 
picture of Harry Truman's graduating class in uh, Independence High School. Harry Truman is the fourth from the left in the back row. You can see him wearing his glasses. He's got his hand on the uh, shoulder of a man in front, young man in front of him. Bess Wallace is in this picture. She is in the second row at the end on the far right. So second row seated on the far right there. And also of interest in this picture is Charlie Ross, who is on the far left front row. And Ross would move on to become Harry Truman's press secretary during uh, Truman's presidency. Truman's education was rigorous in high school, um, although, and he never did attend college, however. Uh, he, he had dreamt as a young man of becoming a, a military general and of going to West Point. After graduation in 1901, he took odd jobs, though, uh, including a railroad timekeeper and a bank clerk. His college dreams were shattered when his father's financial fortunes took a downward turn, uh, and he had to leave Independence for, for uh, a, the town of Grandview, Missouri, which we'll say more about here in a moment. But again, Harry Truman was a lifelong learner and a really self-educated man. Uh, he drew lessons of history throughout his life and career and drew upon them in just a regular conversation, and they helped guide his, his uh, personal philosophy and his leadership style and decision-making. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this is a picture of the Grandview Farm. Grandview is a town just south of Kansas City. It's in the greater Kansas City metro area, though, not far from Independence. And is here, Truman is actually pictured uh, here. He's on the, the right there. Uh, he assisted on his family's farm. As I mentioned, his, his father uh, had some, uh, some speculative businesses that uh, went, went bust. And so uh, Truman was forced to move with his family to this farm uh, that his grandmother owned. She's pictured there seated in the, in the rocking chair. Uh, this was known as the Young Farm. That was his grandmother's name. Um, Truman engaged in numerous activities on the farm, uh, driving horse-drawn plows, doing crop rotations, etc. cetera. Uh, corn and wheat were grown on the, on the farm, as were uh, various uh, kinds of livestock. Now, this is around 1906, okay? So Harry Truman's graduated from high school in 1901, and then he has those periods of odd jobs between 1901 and 1906 when he's forced to move on to the farm. Uh, he told about his numerous activities in letters to his, his friend and on again, off again girlfriend, Bess Wallace, who would become Bess Wallace Truman in the future. Uh, he told about the rigors of farm life um, and how stressful it was. And uh, although he, he had a philosophical view of, of farming too and knew, knew its importance, of course. He kept the financial books as well. Uh, and it was about this time he joined the Masons. Uh, which would become an important part of his, his, his life and his friendships. He stayed on the farm until 1917 when he enlisted in the National Guard and left, for, uh, left the farm for military service in France soon after, uh, for, uh, during World War I. Work on the farm taught him that he could lead farm workers, and it also taught him that he didn't want to be a farmer for the rest of his life. Okay, next slide, please. Harry Truman did not need to serve in World War I. He was 34 years old in 1917, so he was past the enlistment age. But he was inspired by President Woodrow Wilson's call to resist uh, German aggression. And he wanted to see the world uh, beyond, uh, beyond rural uh, in, uh, the Kansas City area, and in the city of Kansas City. He wanted to see the wider world as well. He had an interest in the world by his, by his reading primarily. Uh, and he had the opportunity to serve in combat during World War I. He'd become the only president of the United States that would see combat during World War I. Uh, we could dedicate an entire talk to his service in, in World War I. And fortunately, I, don't, of course, don't have time to say too much, but he served in France in 1918. Uh, he saw action in the Vosges Mountains, the San, San Miguel salient, the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, and Verdun. Uh, he commanded 194 men in an artillery battery, and it is here that he further learned that he could be a leader of men. Uh, he was firm but fair, and by all accounts, the men liked him and respected him uh, because he also showed an interest in them. 
Uh, he could be a disciplinarian, but he also showed an interest in the man on a personal level, and they appreciated that. Uh, in fact, they gave him a, a big silver loving cup as a, a token of appreciation after the war. Uh, Truman really made important bonds uh, during his military service, and he later served as a colonel in the field artillery uh, reserve. Uh, and really, the, the, uh, his military service was a real formative event for him. Uh, next slide, please. He returns from the war in uh, early 1919 when he's mustered out in military service. And he marries his longtime sweetheart, uh, Bess Wallace, on June 28, 1919. Now, he had proposed to Bess in 1911, but she turned him down. And then, shortly before he left for France, Bess suggested that perhaps they should get married before he moved on to France, before he left for France, but he refused, uh, saying he didn't want her to be uh, married, perhaps, to a, a, a cripple, as he put it, or worse, uh, to be a widow. Um, he carried a picture of her uh, in, his, in his pocket overseas, uh, during during the war and in France and, and throughout the rest of his life, uh, he, he remained very faithful to his his uh, beloved Bess. Now, next slide, please. The two set up housekeeping at 219 Delaware Street, which is now a National Park Service uh, his, uh, historic site uh, that you can come, go and visit. It's about five blocks. Uh, south of the, the Truman Presidential Library. And this house would become the, the permanent residence of Harry and Bess Truman for the rest of their lives. And uh, Bess's grandfather had, had built this home, actually. Bess did not grow up in this house, though. She grew up just down the street at, at a house not far from, from this one. Uh, and I wish I had it's such an interesting story about, about, about her life that I wish I had more time to get into. But uh, but it was at this time that Harry realized he had to find a business and, and, and something to make a livelihood with. And it's here that he established his, uh, his haberdashery, which was a, a men's clothing store in downtown Kansas City with a business partner, Eddie Jacobson, which we'll say more about in a little while. Uh, the, the business did not survive very long, though. It, it, uh, uh, it went... Uh, uh, bust, you know, as a result of an economic recession shortly after World War I. Uh, so Harry Truman then had to find another another occupation, which I'll say more about here in a moment. This is the place where this house here is where their only child, Harry and Bess Truman's only child, Margaret, was born in 1924. And this ha house really would remain Bess Truman's sanctuary, uh, as well as her home, <laughs> Uh, for the rest of her life, despite their numerous travels to Washington, D.C. throughout Harry Truman's political career, they would always consider this home and Independence, Missouri as their, their permanent home. Uh, Bess remained Harry Truman's steadfast uh, wife and partner, uh, an advisor behind the scenes. Never one to like the, like the limelight, however. Uh, she liked, preferred to, to be behind the scenes, but Harry Truman consulted her regularly for a variety of different reasons uh, throughout his throughout his career. Okay, uh, next slide please. This is a this is a photo here of where Harry Truman uh, conducted a lot of his business during the 1920s. Uh, he wanted you know, after his haberdashery failed, he turned to politics and that's an interesting story that I wish we had time to get into uh, as well, but he won his first election in 1922 and he won election as judge of Eastern Jackson County. And that was considered a, uh, not a judicial position, it was, a, it was a administrative, uh, akin to a, a county commissioner. And so he was defeated for re-election in 1924, but then in 1926 he was elected as presiding judge of, of the entire county, of Jackson County. Four-year term, like 1926, re-elected in 1930. And this was the, the building where he uh, where he conducted business, and, and visitors can still see the office uh, there. And this is not far either from the Truman home. Uh, it's a walking distance between the Truman home and this, this building, and not far from the Truman Presidential Library as well. I realize this is kind of a dated photo here, probably from the 1970s, but I, I do like it. Um, and it's important in the 1920s to say briefly that Harry Truman 
help helped renovate this building, which is a very old courthouse that predates uh, Truman's uh, uh, life, of course. He won approval for a bond issue for $6.5 million uh, to build 224 miles of paved, paved highways in Jackson County and additional funds for building a county hospital. He also raised money to renovate the courthouse pictured here and to build a new courthouse for Jackson County in downtown Kansas City. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Harry Truman's political careers would uh, not end in, what is it, political ambitions would not end in Jackson County, of course. Uh, he was tapped to run for U.S. Senate. Again, a very interesting story that I wish we uh, could get into here uh, this evening. But uh, he was elected in 1934. And as you see here, the pattern, he's, he's progressing to higher and higher offices. Elected in 1934, he, his patron, I will say, was uh, Thomas Pendergast, uh, the so-called boss of Kansas City at a time when machine politics uh, ruled a lot of large American cities. And uh, the Pendergast machine saw a lot of, of value in running Harry Truman for Senate, plus uh, some of the other candidates they were looking for uh, dropped out for various reasons. Uh, but Harry Truman was a man of, of high integrity uh, and really struggled, though, as being part of this uh, Pendergast machine. He wrote long hand notes, uh, diary-like entries about the struggles he was having with the ethics of trying to work within the framework of the, uh, the Pendergast machine. And, and by all accounts, he was an honest man, and he said, uh, you know, I will, I will leave this office that is the Senate uh, is, you know, poorer in every way that, than when I came in. He, he refused to profit. Uh, from his office, either as presiding judge of Jackson County or as, as U.S. Senator. Uh, he was elected in 1934, as I say, and then six years later was re-elected in 1940. He was popular with his Senate colleagues and played important roles in the passage of bills that became the Transportation Act and the Civil Aeronautics Act. And he also stepped outside uh, uh, what you might expect a Midwestern senator to say. He he spoke about Nazi aggression early during World War II in the early 1940s in an important speech in Chicago, and he spoke about civil rights uh, to an all-white audience in a town called Sedalia, Missouri. And those two speeches are very interesting in terms of uh, Truman stepping out of his comfort zone, so to speak, to challenge some of the great issues of the day. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Truman's most important uh, well, the thing he's most famous for as a U.S. Senator was the so-called Truman Committee, which was the Senate Special Committee to investigate the National Defense Program, which may have saved taxpayers up to $11 billion. Uh, it also put Harry Truman on the cover of Time, raised his political profile and his name recognition, especially among Democratic Party power brokers. So in 1944, uh, Harry Truman was uh, became became uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's vice president for running mate, and this was very crucial because uh, FDR was in declining health. Uh, the public wasn't aware of that, uh, but uh, Democratic Party insiders were well aware of, of FDR's uh, declining health, and they knew that whoever became vice president very likely would become president of the United States, and the incumbent vice president. Henry Wallace was unpalatable for various reasons. Uh, Harry Truman had positive traits, many positive traits, and, and is important, uh, fewer negative ones uh, than others. So he was elected with Franklin Roosevelt in the 1944 election and served 82 days as vice president until Franklin Roosevelt's sudden death on April 12, 1945. So with that, I think I will turn it over to my colleague, Tim. Thank you, Sam. Here we have Dwight D. Eisenhower, 34th President of the United States, and like Harry Truman, very much a product of the American heartland, would have uh, subscribed to a lot of the same values and embodied the same virtues. The men grew up within about 170, 180 miles of each other, um, had a lot of similar experiences. In fact, there was even a, a bit of overlap when Eisenhower's oldest brother, Arthur, at one time lived in the same boarding house as Harry Truman. Uh, around 1900, I believe. Um, and even though the men did share a lot in common and there was a lot of mutual respect, there always 
was not always rather a lot of mutual like for each other, as we'll discuss in a little bit, which is kind of ironic, again, giving so many similarities between the mm. two men. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we'll go to Ike's childhood, and it's it always strikes me as how similar this picture is to the, the picture of Harry Truman's grade school class. It looks like it's about the same size, and they put the students in the same pose. There you can see little Ike on the front row, second from the left, uh, with the arrow pointing to him. And I think it's actually pointing that arrow at the key. He's wearing a key on a string around his neck. So I guess he was uh, sort of a latchkey child, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because he lived directly across the street from his boyhood home, uh, probably a hundred feet from his house. Um, but for whatever reason, he is wearing a key around his neck. He was born October 14th, 1890 in Denison, Texas, which is again, sort of ironic in the Eisenhower story because he became so identified with Kansas and with Abilene. And in fact, he was the only one of the seven Eisenhower boys who was born outside of the state of Kansas. His father had, had suffered a business setback with a sundry sort of dry goods store that he owned in Hope, Kansas, which is about 25 miles south of Abilene. And out of maybe kind of a sense of shame, he, he went to Texas in this self-imposed exile, worked as a wiper on the Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad in, in Denison. And that's where Ike was born in 1892, 1890 rather. And then in 1892, a number of family members convinced them to move back to Abilene. And Ike's father went to work in the uh, Bell Springs Creamery where he worked for many years. Um, his original name was David Dwight Eisenhower. The David was for his father. The Dwight was after a, a famous 19th century evangelist named Dwight Moody. And yet they always called him Dwight because they didn't want him to be called Junior after, after his father. And then like Ulysses S. Grant, when he went to West Point, um, his name officially changed. It was then that he reversed the order from David Dwight Eisenhower to Dwight David Eisenhower and, and became the name that's now, that's now so well known. Um, Abilene was an interesting town. It was only about not even a generation removed from its sort of wild cow town past. Abilene is the terminus of the Chisholm Trail. So you had all that great history of the massive uh, cattle drives up the trail to Kansas. Wild Bill Hickok had been the, the city marshal at one time. And so you had gunfights and everything that goes along with, with, a, with a cow town. And Eisenhower really absorbed and, and, and really enjoyed that history. Coincidentally, 1890, the year he was born, was also the year that the American frontier was, was declared closed. And so you had Eisenhower coming into the world at this transition in American history, you know, from this open frontier, moving into a more industrialized age. And in fact, there's great symmetry in his life. He was born the year the frontier was declared closed and died the year that Americans landed on the moon. So you can see this really broad range of, of history that Eisenhower um, embodied and, and in fact with his creation of NASA, you know, helped uh, help create that. And the foundation also, the foundation rather, I mean the, the frontier gave Ike a sense of limits. If if most of the free land was gone, if natural resources were in danger of, of being exhausted, then there had to be limits set upon expansion and upon what we could expect out of the natural habitat. And for reasons that would take a while to get into, Eisenhower's view of the frontier and of these limited resources would actually lead him to expand social security um, to, a, to a certain degree, uh, which does take some explanations. Maybe we can get into that later. Um, he was a good student. He really enjoyed ancient history. He enjoyed math, uh, did well in school. Uh, next slide, please. We'll see him a few years later. This is his high school his senior picture, I guess we'd call it today. I graduated in 1909. Should have graduated in 1908, but when he was a freshman, he had had an accident, scraped a knee, which became badly infected, and in fact, almost lost a leg and had to repeat his, his freshman year in high school. He had a brother, Edgar, who was a um, little more than a year older who had dropped out of school and returned. And so the brothers would end up graduating together from Abilene High School in 1909, which being high school graduates in 1909 actually put 
one in two, an American elite, only about 30% of Americans graduated from high school at that time. It's roughly three times that now. Um, but Eisenhower, like you know Harry Truman, um, was always academically and educationally ambitious and wanted to get an invitation and, and a good education. Um, he's a very good athlete, played baseball and football at Abilene High School. There, thank you. you. See the baseball team picture. That's Ike on the back row, second from the right. Um, it's always a little difficult to recognize Eisenhower as a young man because he had such a full head of hair. And of course, we don't think of Ike in our imagination or our memories as having a, a full head of hair. Um, usually a center fielder and a running back on the football team. Also organized the Abilene High School Athletic Association, which raised money for equipment and things like that that the student athletes needed. Um, there was a, a prediction in his high school yearbook. For every graduate, there was a prediction made by the editor. And the editor predicted that his brother Edgar would become president of the United States and that Dwight would become a professor of history at Yale University. <laughs> so they were they were close, but not but not quite there. Next slide, please. Um, again, education. Um, Eisenhower really wanted a college education and he wanted to continue playing sports as well. The Eisenhowers were a very modest family economically. Um, some might say poor, but I, I would say that they were still within the middle class. They, they had this home now that we can see on our screens where they moved in 1898. Um, it's now the center of our, our campus, still in its original location. I find it interesting that all three of the homes where Ike lived as a boy are still standing. The first, of course, where he was born in 1890 in Denison, Texas, is still standing and it's, it's a, a state park. There's another house in Abilene on Southeast 2nd Street where the family lived from 1892 to 1898, which is still standing. And then of course this structure, which was built in 1887. And like Truman's, uh, there's a family connection in the acquisition of the home. This home was owned by one of Ike's uncles named Abraham Lincoln Eisenhower and sold the house uh, to his parents in 1898. So Ike lived here from the time that he was about in third grade until he left for West Point in 1911. Unlike Harry Truman, who had dreamed of you know, going to West Point, maybe being a general as a boy, Eisenhower didn't really ever have, he said later, an idea of, of, of that growing up, um, but he really did want a college education. And his brother Edgar did too. And so Edgar started at the University of Michigan. And the idea was that Ike would work for two years and support Edgar and Edgar would drop out and Ike would go for two years and they would kind of leapfrog their, leapfrog their way through college. And so to support Edgar, Eisenhower was working at the Bell Springs Creamery where his father worked, basically as a boiler attendant uh, for about 84 hours a week. It was you know, every night from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Now during that time, he had renewed an acquaintanceship with a, a boy named Sweet Hazlitt Sweet Hazlitt was uh, from a, a rather affluent family. His father was a physician in Abilene. He'd gone to a, a private military academy and Sweet was going to the Naval Academy. And he told Ike that you know, if you want to get a college education, you should get a service academy appointment. And so Ike then dedicated himself to trying to get an appointment to either Annapolis or West Point. He really didn't have a strong preference. He just wanted that college education and he wanted someone to pay for it. And so while he's tending the boiler, he's also studying every night during those, those 12 hours. Um, does well on the appointment. There's a competitive exam offered by Senator Joseph Bristow. And then Eisenhower secures an appointment. He was too old, however, to go to Annapolis. Uh, by this time, he was 20 years old and he would not start college until he was almost 21. And that would have made him a year too old uh, for eligibility at Annapolis. And so he ends up going to West Point which is fine with him because again, he just wants that college education and he wants to continue playing sports. And so he goes to West Point in 1911 and indeed becomes um, a football star. And in fact, he's starting to gain a lot of national attention, um, plays in a, a game against uh, the famous Jim Thorpe, Carlisle Indian School. Um, is on the verge of being a star when he suffers a really catastrophic knee injury in a game against Tufts University. And that's basically the end of his athletic career. Nothing he could 
they could fix at the time. And it was probably a torn ACL or something along those lines that are, that are fairly routine now. Uh, but it was enough to end his athletic career and almost cost him um, his commission. And in fact, he could not join the cavalry because his knee could not take mounting and, and dismounting the horse. But um, he did make it through West Point academically. He was kind of middling in the middle of the class. So he had a very high number of demerits. Um, a lot of a lot of things. Um, of course, minor infractions, but he accumulated an awful lot of them. Um, his best scores were in English and in mathematics. In fact, he created some solutions to math problems that be became then the school uh, solutions. Um, did not like history, did not like West Point's uh, rote memorization approach to history and, and lost this boyhood love that he had had, which was later rekindled uh, by an officer who was influential in his life. Next slide, please. Ike and Mamie went on to become such a such a famous pair. Um, Ike's just out of West Point. He's, he goes to Fort Sam Houston, which is in San Antonio, Texas, which is still there. And he meets Mamie Geneva Dowd. Uh, Mamie came from a wealthy Denver family. In fact, her father had become a millionaire, still in his 40s, uh, thanks to the meatpacking business in Iowa in the 19th century, back when a millionaire you know, really meant something. So really immense wealth uh, for the time. Lived in Denver, as I said, but they would spend their, their winters um, in San Antonio where it was a, a good deal warmer. And really the two met um, not long after Ike's arrival in the fall of 1915. And by Valentine's Day, 1916, were engaged and then married on July 1st, 1916. The war also affected their plans as they did Harry and Bess in that whether, rather than waiting, uh, the Eisenhowers decided to speed up their plans. And so they got married um, fairly soon. But of course, it was a very good, you know, an enduring marriage and a very, very successful partnership. <clears throat> Next picture, please. But of course, there was that war. Um, and as, as Sam said, uh, Harry Truman's the only president to have served in combat in World War I. Well, combat's what Dwight Eisenhower wanted more than anything. He, you know, he felt that in order to make his mark as an officer to advance his career, he had to get to France and made so many requests to get to France that he was threatened with disciplinary action. But instead, um, he was already, had already been recognized for these great managerial and administrative abilities that, that he would become famous for. And so instead of going to France, he becomes the director of the National Tank Training Center at Camp Colt, Pennsylvania, which is by Gettysburg. And Eisenhower was in charge of training almost all American tankers. In fact, at one time he had about 10,000 men under his command. He was one of three graduates from the class in 1915 to become a Lieutenant Colonel, although it's only a temporary promotion. And here you can see him in, in front of a uh, Renault tank, um, of the, the type that were used. No idea who the guy is sticking his face out of the, uh, the hatch there, but there is a young Dwight Eisenhower, um, won very high marks, again, for his administration of the camp and also um, for his administration of um, public health during the Spanish flu influenza epidemic of that time, which I think we can all relate to better now than we could um, a year or so ago. But he was again, you know, bitterly disappointed as he put it at, at missing the chance for combat in France. Um, Eisenhower was always considered by his, by his peers to, to be blessed with a lot of luck. Um, and luck is something that many successful generals have been credited with having. And you know, in fact, Napoleon's question of a general was always, is he lucky? And for whatever reason, Eisenhower had that, had that, that, that gift. Um, one of the boys from Kansas, Aaron Plattner, who had taken the West Point or the Service Academy qualifying test along with Ike, but did not get an appointment. Um, went to France in the infantry and was killed. Another boy who competed against Ike um, and didn't get the appointment to West Point, went to the Air Corps and was killed. So there was like several of these guys who were associated with Ike and in his efforts you know, to go to West Point or Annapolis, he went into the regular army um, instead and lost their lives in World War I. And so who knows what Eisenhower actually avoided 
um, by the, the, the fate that, uh, that, that he actually experienced. Um, but that seems to be kind of a theme throughout his life for these fortuitous events. But probably because he missed that experience. Next slide, please. He eagerly, eagerly volunteered for the 1919 Transcontinental Motor Convoy, which was a coast-to-coast -coast, um, demonstration of America's new mechanized army. And also a test of that capability to see how well these new largely you know, mobile mechanized uh, units could do. Um, and also a test of how well America was prepared to defend itself by giving its army access to these roads. And it, the answer was not very well. Um, 58 days from Washington DC to San Francisco, they averaged not quite 60 miles a day. And in some places across the country, the roads were virtually non-existent. In many places, they had to build bridges to actually <laughs> continue their, their journey. Um, the big thing to come out of this is it put in Eisenhower's mind the idea that we needed a really good national grid of, of roads. And you, you know, eventually, you see the interstate highway system um, come out of, of this experience, along with his experience later on the, the German Autobahn. But this is what planted that first seed was this two month crawl across the country from coast to coast with the transcontinental motor convoy. But it was a very formative experience in Ike's life. And you can see um, in the picture on the right, Eisenhower is on the right of that picture. And I believe to his immediate left is one of the fire stones. There would usually be a reception in every city that they went to. And in this case, they actually stopped at the Firestone headquarters, which I believe are in Ohio. Uh, if memory serves. But again, very important experience in Ike's life. Next slide, please. He returned, uh, went to what was then called Camp Meade, Maryland, the home of the Tank Corps, where he continued for a couple of years following the motor convoy. And then he went to Panama. And in Panama, he was the executive director, executive officer rather, of uh, an infantry brigade under a general named Fox Connor, who'd been in charge of military operations uh, under John Pershing during World War I. And Connor was a very influential mentor and in Ike. He put him on an extensive kind of professional uh, reading program, rekindled Ike's love of uh, military history and really groomed Ike uh, for advancement. Um, he also prepared him to go to the Army's Command and General Staff school, as it was called at the time, at Fort Leavenworth, which was a real watershed for career army officers. And often how you, how you did at, at you know, Leavenworth could determine, um, in large part, the course your career was going to take. So Eisenhower goes to Leavenworth, thanks to General Connor's intervention and, and training preparation, um, graduates first in his class. And oper that opens up a lot of opportunities for him. He goes to Washington and under retired General John J. Pershing um, is assigned to the American Battle Monuments Commission, who are in charge of all the cemeteries in Europe following the war. They're also charged with putting out a guidebook to the battle monuments and the cemeteries. Um, Eisenhower, as I mentioned, uh, was a very good student, English student at West Point, and was considered one of the best writers in the, in the War Department. Um, Pershing assigned him to finish writing a book that some others had started, and then Ike was given the opportunity to go to France for a year, do more research and rewrite that volume, which he did. And so they spent 1928, 1929, Ike and Mamie and their son, John, um, in France. And Ike would spend his days, as you can see in this picture here, out touring the battlefields. And so he got to examine the entire Western Front that he had missed uh, during World War I. Um, and so he was able to at least gain an appreciation of that ground and those battles from this experience that he'd missed in 1917 and 1918. Um, he returns, uh, finishes up this guidebook, which you can still find uh, copies of, surprisingly, becomes an assistant to the Assistant Secretary of War, uh, studying war mobilization, travels around the United mm -hmm. States studying um, how ready industry would be to convert to a wartime footing, you know, if, if that should occur. 
uh, works closely with Congress and other political leaders. And it's a really good education just in the ways of Washington, in the ways of the political bureaucracy. And as Ike later said, it was his, it was his introduction to the military industrial complex that he would make so famous in, in his, his farewell address. Um, he then becomes an assistant to Douglas MacArthur, who was the Army Chief of Staff. And then he follows MacArthur to Panama, um, where MacArthur's there really to form a Philippine Army and Defense Force in preparation for the island's eventual independence. And there, Eisenhower is really given the day-to-day -day work of building an army from scratch. Um, again, just an invaluable experience. Um, I know we need to, to get moving, so next slide, please. At, at the end of, of, of this career of, of really hard work and a lot of ambition, of course, culminates um, in his appointment as the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force. And in a, his supreme moment uh, on June 6, 1944, is the, the D-Day invasion, which I really think is the moment uh, that at that moment, you could people knew that he was probably going to be president someday. Just the respect that he had and the, and the reputation for competence and, and leadership you know, it was pretty obvious that this guy was was someone to look out for politically. And here's that iconic photograph of Eisenhower with the men of the 101st Airborne uh, the night before the invasion. And he kept a copy of this picture um, on his desk uh, the rest of his life, whether as president or as a, a private citizen. Next slide, please. And he left this message um, the night before the, the invasion taking personal responsibility if the invasion failed. And this is an item that we have in the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum. And I think it's our single most important item just because of not only the how momentous that historic occasion was, but just what it tells you about Eisenhower's leadership and, and, and his sense of duty. Um, yeah. If you can't read it, it says, our landings in the Cherbourg Harbor area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based upon the best information available. The troops, the air, and the Navy did all that um, bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. And then some of you will see that it's misdated July 5th, but we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. But I think we better keep moving into the presidency at this point. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Okay, we're going to shift gears and talk about Harry Truman. And, uh, you know, many of the things Tim and I are talking about could themselves be separate talks. So I do apologize for glossing over some very important things, but I'm hoping to at least hit some highlights. I mentioned Harry Truman becomes president suddenly in, on April 12, 1945. And uh, few, few, if any, presidents have ever faced uh, similar challenges uh, that Harry Truman faced, uh, particularly since he was very ill-prepared by Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, the two had only had two meetings during his 82-day vice presidency. And what was happening was uh, the war against Germany, that is World War II against Germany, was, was, was concluding, and it would conclude uh, in May, uh, the following month, but the war against Japan was still very much uh, happening, ongoing. And so Harry Truman was faced with how to end the war against Japan and dealing with uh, the issues of post-war Europe uh, and Asia after the war. And so he has a meeting here in uh, July of 1945 with the, the so-called Big Three meeting, Winston Churchill, Truman, and Joseph Stalin. Uh, Churchill, of course, the British leader, and Stalin, the, the Russian leader, the Soviet leader, uh, who were our allies during the war. And, you know, Harry Truman, some of his greatest successes had to do with the forming of a, a framework or a structure uh, to conduct the, the Cold War, which would occur after the end of World War II. That is a Cold War conflict that would last for 40 years between the United States and the Soviet Union. So although we're allies of the Soviet Union during World War II, those relations would sour uh, soon after the successful conclusion of the war. And Truman 
uh, helped establish that framework through the Marshall Plan, which was a huge aid package to, to Europe for European recovery after World War II, the establishment of NATO, uh, the, the defense uh, alliance with our European allies, uh, the Truman Doctrine, uh, which was more of the uh, ideological framework for containment, uh, that is, how to, how to deal with the Soviet Union, not through aggressive war, but through containing their expansion, and, of course, uh, not the least, uh, the establishment of the United Nations uh, to try to prevent war and to promote peace throughout the world. So in this photograph, we have Truman meeting with, with the, uh, the big three. Okay, next slide, please. One of the things that Harry Truman had to deal with, as I mentioned, was concluding the war against Japan. And he had options available to him. Uh, he had approved shortly after becoming president uh, the first part of a planned invasion of the Japanese home islands. Of course, that ended up not being necessary when he was briefed shortly after becoming president by the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, about the progress of the Manhattan Project, which would develop the, the atomic bomb. And Harry Truman, as was his leadership style, would gather as much information as he could from experts and rely on that, their, their experts, you know, their expertise with very little ego, you know, associated with it. He was willing to have people in the room that he knew were experts and smarter than, than him in, in their various areas. But in the end, the buck stopped with Harry Truman. You know, the buck stops here, his famous sign. Uh, so he always knew, you know, that he was the one who made the decisions. So for Harry Truman, the decision to use the atomic bomb or authorize its use uh, was uh, was a simple one, you know. As a as an ex artillery officer, uh, he saw the the bomb probably without complete understanding of it uh, as a weapon to end the war and save American lives, and that was his goal uh, that he successfully uh, accomplished. And we still, uh, you know, over the years have gotten thank you from veterans and their families for Truman's use of the bomb to to end the war and to save the lives of American servicemen who would have been lost in the event of an invasion. Uh, the atomic bomb was successfully tested in July of 1945, and uh, you know it was used in August, August uh, twice actually, against Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6 and August 9 respectively, and it brought the war to successful conclusion. Uh, again, we could talk a lot more about these issues, but uh, uh, no, no evidence has ever, there's no evidence Truman ever agonized about this matter, uh, which remains, of course, a, a controversial one, though. Uh, next slide, please. One of the most important things Harry Truman accomplished uh, as, as president, in addition to ending the war against uh, Japan, was extending recognition to the new state of Israel in 1948. And for Harry Truman, this was a moral, humanitarian, and yes, a political issue. Uh, he was keenly aware of the suffering of the Jewish people and other displaced persons uh, during and after World War II. Uh, and uh, of real importance here was Eddie Jacobson, who's photographed here with Truman there on the left, uh, who personally intervened with Harry Truman on this issue. Uh, Truman showed really strong leadership here. Uh, many of his own advisors opposed recognition of Israel for geopolitical and economic reasons. And, uh, but but uh, Jacobson personally interceded with Truman to, uh, to see what would become the future president of Israel, uh, Kain Weizmann. Uh, and that conversation was a very pivotal one. Uh, Truman's own advisors, uh, most notably George Marshall, opposed this decision. Uh, the fear among his advisors was that it would cut off oil supplies uh, because of possible Arab embargo if we were to recognize Israel, uh, and it would increase the, the leverage or power of the Soviet Union in the Middle East. Uh, and these are some powerful voices, uh, but again, Harry Truman was willing to listen and in the end made his own decision. Uh, next slide, please. You know, a lot of people have asked me. Okay. All right. I think we'll probably just go ahead and, and skip the, the video there in the interest of, of time. So one of the things that Harry Truman had to deal with as well, in a very eventful eight-year presidency, 
was the invasion of South Korea by North Korea in June of 1950. And the, the real takeaway here was that Harry Truman, in his own reading of history, in his own experience, knew that aggression had to be met uh, with force if necessary. And so Harry Truman authorized the use of American military forces under the leadership of the United Nations, and that's a very important thing, uh, and the leadership of General Dwight, uh, sorry, uh, Douglas MacArthur uh, to lead those United Nations forces uh, in, in June of 1950. Truman made a quick decision. Well, he, he heard the, the, uh, the advice of his advisors on this, but in the end, he wanted to preserve South Korean independence, which is what he did. Uh, he helped avert World War III as well. Douglas MacArthur had a difference of opinion on how to conduct the war. And in short, Truman ended up firing Douglas MacArthur the following spring, ensuring primacy of civilian control of the military. Uh, and this was also the first successful stress test, uh, to put it lightly, uh, for the United Nations, which was a, a fledgling organization established uh, in 1945 and, and something very important near and dear to Harry Truman's uh, heart. Uh, next slide, please. In the domestic realm, uh, Harry Truman uh, did a lot for the issue of civil rights. He had been appalled by the treatment and abuse of African-American veterans following World War II. And this was a remarkable thing with Truman's own past, uh, as both his grandparents had been slaveholders in Missouri. Uh, and Truman was known in some of his early letters to best is to use racist language. And so that context is important when you think about what Truman was able to accomplish in the area of civil rights. He established a Civil Rights Commission, which is uh, uh, pictured here. Pictured here. Uh, for him, civil rights was a moral issue. Uh, he believed that America should treat all of its citizens equitably, especially during the Cold War, uh, so that the American form of government could be an attractive model for the world. Uh, next slide, please. Truman became the first president to speak before the uh, NAACP. The speech took place in Washington, D.C. in 1947. And you can read there uh, what, what he said uh, during that speech. Very, very important. And this would come at a time of great political risk to Truman himself uh, by his own Democratic Party uh, which, uh, in the South, anyway, uh, was, uh, well, the Democratic Party was very powerful in the South uh, at, at that time. And there were very conservative uh, Southern uh, Democrats, particularly in the Senate, which opposed Truman's civil rights uh, platform, which would result in a split in his own party, a three-way split, uh, during the 1948 election. Uh, next slide, please. One of the most pivotal, pivotal documents in our collection at the Truman Library is, uh, is the, this executive order here, which is the uh, executive order uh, 9981, which established a committee on the quality of treatment and opportunity in the armed forces, uh, or in short, resulted in the eventual uh, uh, desegregation of the armed forces. Uh, he also issued another executive order desegregating the federal civil service. Uh, Truman used executive orders because he couldn't get even basic bills through, through Congress uh, on civil rights. He was unable to get an anti-lynching bill passed or legislation even to abolish the poll tax. Uh, so that, that showed you the context uh, that he's working in here. We talk about some of the weaknesses or failures or uh, challenges of the Truman presidency, and we'll move on to the next slide, please. And that's in the area of Korea. And again, these are big issues that we don't have time to get into here, but in late 1950, Truman authorized the use of the United Nations forces to push North Korean forces back across the 38th parallel back into North Korea. In other words, not only did he push, out, push North Korean forces out of South Korea, he authorized the use of those same forces to pursue uh, the North Koreans across the border try to unify the country, remove the North Korean government of Kim Il-sung. Uh, however, what happened is that the push went too far to the border with China, 
uh, which which is the North Korea's northern border, and that resulted in a massive invasion by Chinese forces in support of North Korea, uh, the North Korean allies. Um, and so this resulted in a protracted stalemate uh, of the Korean War uh, that Tim, I'm sure, will, will say more about here. But it really cost Truman politically um, uh, and the Democratic Party in 19, 1952 election. And Korea, in addition to its, its very positive um, legacy, had also a negative legacy of limited, limited undeclared wars, uh, which did not result in a Third World War, but did exact a very high price on civilian populations in Korea and later, particularly in Vietnam, and on American service members killed or injured during those conflicts. And of course, in Korea, there was no peace treaty, even to this day. Uh, next slide, please. And what we have here is another more negative aspect of the Truman presidency, despite all the, the, the glowing things that Truman accomplished for the world and the country. Uh, the loyalty board, the establishment of the loyalty board was not one of them. Uh, even prior to Joseph McCarthy making accusations of communists in government, uh, just three years prior, uh, Harry Truman had issued an executive order uh, deal that would create a loyalty board uh, that has a lot of aspects to it. But basically, it was Truman's effort to try to uh, preempt more uh, more uh, stringent efforts by the Republicans to uh, to uh, try to uh, root out communists. So even before McCarthy's charges, uh, Harry Truman was dealing with the communists and government issue, uh, and it was an issue that he really didn't he didn't think there was a severe threat, you know, to the U.S. government by by uh, by communists uh, within the government. But he did establish his loyalty board, and uh, part of the problem here is that. Uh, that Truman distrusted the FBI, which was really involved in this loyalty, implementing the loyalty program, and Truman disliked its director, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Charges could be based only on unfounded accusations, uh, and there were a number of employees who, who lost their jobs, uh, some of them, you know, for legitimate reasons, but others uh, because uh, they were, they were uh, just rooted out uh, and un unfairly rooted out. Standards of procedural safeguards and standards of evidence were lacking. Uh, so I think we'll move on here. Uh, I'll pass it uh, pass it on to you, Tim. Okay. Well, just a little quick background. Eisenhower, uh, following World War II, became the Army Chief of Staff. Uh, he eventually retires from the Army and becomes the president of Columbia University. Uh, during that time, he's he's called back to service sort of part-time in Washington, since they're combining some of the military services, and Eisenhower becomes the first sort of informal chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, then also, while he's still at Columbia, uh, President Truman taps Ike to become the first Supreme Allied Commander of NATO in December of 1950, and then in early 1951, Eisenhower goes uh, to France. Um, I believe it was still in France at the time. Um, to, to take up that, that position. And in many ways, I mean, his running for president was to protect me, these internationalist organizations that, same ones that Harry Truman supported. The Republican Party at that time was deeply divided between sort of Eastern moderates who believed in internationalism, they believed in the United Nations, they believed in NATO, they believed in a European, European uh, defense community as opposed to the more America first um, um, old guard conservatives as they were all often described led by uh, Senator Robert Taft. Um, Eisenhower had for a number of years uh, been declining invitations to run for president as both a Democrat and a Republican. And we know from both men's diaries, uh, Dwight Eisenhower's and Harry Truman's and Harry Truman uh, brought Eisenhower to the White House and offered to run as his vice president if Ike wanted to run for president as a Democrat. Ike was a Republican. Um, he, and largely because he believed the Democrats had been in power for too long in Washington, for you know, 20 years in the White House, that there was had been too much centralization of power and too much deficit spending. Those were his main reasons for identifying 
as a Republican, but it was as a fairly liberal to moderate Republican dedicated to internationalism. Um, had Robert Taft, in fact, there was a meeting between the two men and Eisenhower said, if you'll agree to support say NATO and the United Nations and the Euro European defense community, I will, I will publicize this letter I'm holding saying that I am not a candidate for president in 1952. Um, Taft would not agree to, the, to that statement um, that he, Taft, Taft would continue to oppose those organizations. And so Eisenhower decided to run largely for those reasons um, against Taft. Um, and then given his popularity, just in general was able then to easily win uh, the election once he had won the Republican nomination, which took a little more work. But at any rate, um, to get quickly in, into this slide, um, when we're talking about the greatest things that Ike saw as accomplishments or as failures that we'll discuss, I, I like to use his words. And he thought in terms of foreign policy, the end of the Korean War was the first one. Um, as Sam said, the war had stalemated, became a big problem for President Truman. Eisenhower, during the campaign in October of, of 1952, in a speech in Detroit, pledged that you know, if I am elected, I will go to Korea. And just the image of the successful military leader saying he was going to go to look at the situation inspired a lot of confidence. In fact, it gave him like an immediate 5% uh, bump in the polls. Um, President Truman kind of sneered and then asked Ike after the election if he still wanted to go to Korea, or if that was just kind of an empty campaign pledge. But Ike did, visited Korea in December of 52 and kind of got the lay of the land and decided it wasn't worth uh, continuing. Um, came back and, um, you know, by July 27th, 1953, there was uh, an armistice, or at least a, a ceasefire, technically. Um, a lot of that also had to do with the fact that Joseph Stalin had died in March of 53, which I think made it, made it easier, made it possible for that to take place. And also I would point to uh, what he described as the prevention of communistic efforts to dominate Iran, Guatemala, Lebanon, Formosa, that is Taiwan and South Vietnam. But as we'll see, um, some of the means he used uh, would, would come back to haunt us. For example, overthrowing the Mossadegh regime in Iran uh, by, by covert means. Next slide, please. In fact, uh, those images you see on the screen, they're from the same page in his diary. And up until May of 2010, if, if you had asked to see Eisenhower's diary from October 8th of 1953, you would have been given that page on the left, which is mostly, as you can see, redacted. If you look on the right, you can see Eisenhower talking about um, these recent developments in Iran, which were um, accomplished thanks to the CIA, and which he said reads like a dime novel, and basically admits that we, you know, by by force overthrew the government of Iran by by covert means. It was not a very well kept secret, but technically this part of his diary remained classified until you know about the last ten years, which is quite a while um, after Eisenhower's. Uh, presidency. But again, you could see how you know, it, relations with Iran um, have still been troubled by this, this action that he took. But he believed it was worth it just given the, the stakes of the Cold War. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of foreign policy failure, Eisenhower said, I admit to little progress in global disarmament or in reducing the bitterness of the East-West struggle. You know, there were certainly attempts to improve relations with the Soviet Union. Um, one of the last was undermined by Eisenhower's own decision. There was to be a summit in Paris in May of 1960. Unfortunately, um, shortly beforehand, he gave a green light to one of the last missions of the U-2 spy plane, which flew over Russia and was shot down. Um, he was perturbed that Francis Gary Powers, the pilot, did not use the uh, kill pill that he was given to take his own life and was captured by the Soviets and um, the cat was out of the bag at that point. What you see on the screen is the first cover story that was put out. The United States knew that the U-2 had disappeared, but they said it was on a mission collecting weather data, which is kind of a likely story you know, for a cover of a, of a spy operation. But Eisenhower decided very quickly that it was useless to try to keep up the pretense and that we'd, we'd simply been caught. 
which then undermined uh, yet another conference, uh, peace conference with the Soviet Union. And as you can see it troubled Eisenhower, these words are, are from his memoir, but he did consider that his, his greatest foreign policy failure. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of accomplishments, domestic accomplishments, um, in 1966, at a time when Eisenhower felt that he was under a lot of criticism, largely thanks to two best-selling books, one by Arthur Schlesinger Jr. called A Thousand Days about the presidency of John F. Kennedy, and another book about President Kennedy by Ted Sorensen, I believe it's just called Kennedy. He thought put his administration in, in a really poor light. Um, and so he put out a memo to his friends. And he said, I just dashed these things off the top of my head. And, but it's this really kind of detailed memo. And we often at work refer to it as Ike's top 10. He actually lists about 23 things. And so I just have some of them here on, on the screen for your consideration. But of course, he added uh, two, two states rather to the union were added during Ike's presidency, the 49th states. St. Lawrence Seaway was built. Uh, the first, significantly, the first civil rights bill in 80 years, one in 1957, one in 1960, dealing largely with voting rights uh, were passed. Uh, the most ambitious road program by any nation in all history, of course, is our interstate highway system. Eisenhower did not completely reject the New Deal. In fact, he really accommodated much of, ICE, of FDR's New Deal and Harry Truman's Fair Deal. The interstate highway system costs more than all of the New Deal social programs and work programs combined. So it was a massive public expenditure and of course something that many of us experience almost daily in our, in our commutes. Um, he notes, as you can see, the initiation of the space program, which was NASA began under President Eisenhower. Next slide, please, just to kind of finish this one off. The segregation in Washington, DC and the armed forces, the defense education bill, which occurred in the wake of the uh, Sputnik, um, Soviet Union Sputnik satellite, which really put a scare into Americans in terms of our technological capabilities. And the defense education bill was one of our responses to it. The use of federal power to enforce orders of a federal court in Arkansas, Little Rock, which we'll discuss. Um, but on and on, Eisenhower saw these as accomplishments that were being overlooked in sort of what he felt was this adulation of, um, of, of John F. Kennedy's administration. Next slide, please. In terms of what you might say were Ike's failures, um, Sam alluded to uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy's um, anti-communist crusade and, and, and hearings. Um, Eisenhower was very anti-McCarthy and really worked behind the scenes, which he preferred to do in combating McCarthy, but did not uh, confront McCarthy directly, which is still a better debate. There's still being books published even in the last few months of Eisenhower's dealings with Joe McCarthy, whether he took the right tact or not. So that's one that's not going away anytime soon. Um, he admittedly self did not convert the Republican Party to what he called his middle way governing philosophy. And he did not provide uh, moral rhetorical support in terms of civil rights and as a, as a civil rights leader, it was a little tepid. Um, for example, after the Brown versus Board Supreme Court case, he didn't say, you know, this was a just decision, you know, it's way overdue. Um, he just said the Supreme Court has spoken and I was sworn to uphold the law, which looked like that he, he almost disagreed with the court, but he would kind of, you know, um, accept it and, and move on. Um, and something else that's come up um, that I have more awareness of an issue. Sam and I first did this program um, more than 10 years ago. And so a lot of these slides were put together at that time. And one, of course, I think thing that many of us have more awareness of um, is the history of gay civil rights. And as Truman had his loyalty review board, Eisenhower banned gays in federal employment in the mid 1950s, largely for security reasons too. And so you're starting to see you know, more criticism of, of Ike for that action um, as well, but it's all within the same context of, of security and the Cold War and the Soviet Union, which is not to excuse it, but I think something that can clearly you know, be, be seen as a, a knock on, on his leadership. 
next slide, please. Well, we all know what Harry Truman's saying was. I think everyone knows the buck stops here. Eisenhower had a saying too, you can see it here in Latin. Um, so I'm sure my pronunciation is incorrect. Suave tour in modo, fortier in re, uh, which is gently, basically gently in manner, uh, strong in deed. And you can hear sort of echoes of uh, Teddy Roosevelt in there too, of speak softly and carry a big stick. And really what Ike was talking about was that it's not so much your words or especially flashy or, or fancy words, but it, it's, it's what you accomplish that matters. And again, he was kind of putting himself in comparison when he would talk about this later with John F. Kennedy, who he seen, he viewed as being perhaps more sizzled than at stake in his estimation. But Eisenhower did not really trust, uh, oh, even someone like uh, Senator McCarthy, not Senator McCarthy, General MacArthur, um, who was so strong on, on rhetoric and on his ego, um, which Eisenhower really um, found distasteful. Um, it's just kind of a personality difference between the two men, but I think it's Eisenhower's view and Eisenhower's preference is expressed well in, in this motto, which was on a plaque um, that, that sat on his desk in the White House. Next slide, please. Um, civil rights is, despite what was done um, in terms of banning gays from federal employees, Eisenhower's attempts to advance the civil rights of African-Americans are probably one of the biggest areas of revision in terms of Eisenhower's scholarship. And here's just um, you know, a number of bullet points you can see of things that he was able to accomplish in terms of that's just banning discrimination in firms receiving federal contracts, uh, completing the desegregation of armed forces began under President Truman, uh, rebuilding the federal judiciary with integrationist judges, or signing those two civil rights bills, establishing the Civil Rights Division within the DOJ, the Civil Rights Commission, sending federal troops to Little Rock, and appointing a fellow named Frederick Morrow, first African-American executive in the White House, and even the first African-American secretary, and also the first African-American at a cabinet meeting. So Eisenhower did take steps, um, and much like Harry Truman, perhaps as, about as much as he could have done in the era and in the context. But again, it's, it's another part of his um, presidency that's still getting a lot of attention from scholars. Next slide, please. I think it's back okay. to Sam. Great, okay, great. Thank you, Tim. Well, I think in the interest of time, because I know we wanna take some questions, we're gonna go quickly through these next few slides that show uh, some photographs from the Truman Library's collection of Harry Truman with Dwight Eisenhower. This picture here is taken at the Potsdam Conference. And that's Omar Bradley in the, in the car as well. Here's Harry Truman in 1948 awarding uh, General Eisenhower a third oak leaf cluster. Uh, there's extensive correspondence between the two men in the Truman papers during the Truman presidency. Unfortunately, that would end as a result of the 1952 campaign, which was a contentious one. Uh, this is a meeting that took place uh, between the two men shortly after Eisenhower was elected president in 1952. You can see by the expression there that it's rather tense for various reasons. But Truman was quick to congratulate uh, Eisenhower upon his victory in 1952. Truman decided not to run for president, by the way, in 1952. It was Adelie Stevenson who was the Democratic nominee. Uh, there was a long period of, of uh, tension that went through the Eisenhower presidency between the two men. But Eisenhower did visit, visit the Truman Presidential Library in 1961 after Eisenhower left office, and Eisenhower wanted to see the layout of our building in Independence, Missouri. And so Truman himself gave Eisenhower a tour. The real reconciliation between the two men, though, occurred as a result of the tragic events in November 1963, the John F. Kennedy funeral, uh, which brought the two men together for a long conversation. So although they never really would become friends, I think Tim would agree with that, uh, they at least mended their fences enough to be amicable. And they also uh, met on several occasions at, at various funerals, uh, uh, sad occasions, but uh, did bring the two men together. And then the next slide, please. And I think that quote probably says a lot there. And um, can we go to the next one, please? 
Tim, if you don't mind, maybe we can just conclude with this, this survey, which was the latest presidential survey. Yeah, I think what's Andy? one, yeah. I'm sorry, Sam. Uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. It's just so interesting. Of course, when President Truman left office, he had extremely low approval rating. Uh, mm -hmm. When Eisenhower left office, about a year after Ike left office, Arthur Schlesinger Sr. Did, did a big poll for the New York Times of, of ranking the presidents and drawing upon you know, the expertise of his, of his colleagues. And Eisenhower ranked, was it 22nd out of 34 presidents, down around Chester Arthur, I believe, which really incensed Ike and, and his inner circle. And one thing it did lead to was trying to get the papers in Abilene available to scholars as quickly as possible so they could tell their, their side of the story. And I think with both you know, the, the availability of the records in Abilene and in independence that both men's reputations have risen in direct correlation to the release of those papers and for scholars to get a firsthand look at what was really going on. And now both men are, you know, into really the near great category. Um, in fact, about as high as you can get without being in the, in the real upper <laughs> stratosphere of the American presidency. And so they both really rose fairly rapidly in, in reputation um, since the time they left office. And again, so much in, in part in part to the archival record, uh, but also just that advantage that, that hindsight gives us. And, and probably we'll have to say in comparison to some other successors, they look pretty good too. Um, but it, it has been a remarkable rise for both men. Um, and can you really rank people as precisely? No. Um, and these, there's always still some subjectivity associated with these polls, but you could see in, in the estimation, estimation of professional historians and political scientists, uh, both men are in, are in really good company um, at yeah. this time. Uh, but there'll be further revisions. Um, some president's stock goes really down. Woodrow Wilson used to be ranked among the top presidents, mm -hmm. but Wilson's record on race and single-handedly, you know, segregating um, Washington, D.C. And, and the federal bureaucracy it has really made him drop in, in the eyes of many, um, many students now. Um, and that will happen with things that decisions of both um, Ike and President Truman made will probably affect how they're seen in the future by historians, too. But both men have had, had remarkable uh, posthumous uh, presidential careers, at least among, among scholars. So. Yep, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that, Tim. And so I think we'll turn it back to you, Morgan. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Sam and Tim, for a wonderful presentation. If you have a question and haven't added it to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, please go ahead and do so now. You can also like a question that's already been submitted that you would like to see answered. And we'll just take a few of these here. Okay, so the first question we have is from Tim. It's from Zachary and asks, is there a book you came across that deals with Eisenhower's views on the frontier as limited, or is that drawn from your own observation? It's not in any book yet. Um, there are a number of letters um, in which I spells that out for a friend of his. Uh, there's an article I did uh, that appeared in Prologue magazine um, in 2015, which you could probably find online. Uh, but no one's really expanded on that in a, in a book yet, which I've, I've always found it such an interesting tie of Eisenhower's view on the campaign, um, on the campaign, the frontier, and how that affected his ideas on economics and any number of things and on, on policy. Um, if there are a way, I'd, I'd be happy to make uh, copies of those uh, documents available to you. So if you'd just like to contact the library, we could do that. Um, but he did talk about it quite a bit. And he's... You know, uh, explains it really well. Excellent. All right. Our next question is from Pam. And Pam asks, what was Eisenhower's most defining moment that he designated in his life outside of D-Day? Well, he was often asked what his, his greatest accomplishments were. And he would usually say the defeat of Nazi Germany 11 months after invading the continent of Europe and eight years of peace and prosperity as president. Those were his, his stock answers. But at age 77, you know, Eisenhower was a very avid golfer. 
And in retirement in Palm Springs, California, he shot a hole in one at age 77 and he called that his greatest achievement. So <laughs> I guess that puts it all in context, but generally that de the defeat of Hitler and then the eight years of peace and prosperity is what he considered his, his crowning oh. moments. I guess he had two. Okay, I think we'll take this last question in here. It's a little bit longer of one, but I think it should be fun. Um, there's a question from Richard that says, both HSP and DVE are ranked in the top 10 of effective presidents could you each argue why the other should be ranked ahead of your guy? So, Tim, you would have to argue <laughs> for Harry. Sam, you would have to argue for Ike. And we'll, we'll end after this one. Okay. Uh, do you want to <laughs> take a stab at that one, Tim? <laughs> yeah, I was just I was hoping you would. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that in many ways um, – he might, he might admit, have to admit grudgingly that Truman devised some policies that he agreed with that he followed, mm -hmm. um, particularly in foreign policy, in containment. And then when Eisenhower became president, he okay. formed this committee and had a code name of Project Solarium, and where they had teams that debated different foreign policy approaches, one of which was containment, one was liberation, and one was like massive retaliation. They basically came out with a containment-like foreign policy that was clearly based on, on Truman's model. But, you know, also in other ways, Eisenhower followed uh, Democrat policies, like in the New Deal, which he accommodated. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in other ways, I, I think he would have had to admit that, you know, he found their ideas useful, if, if maybe perhaps in some need of modification or better administration, um, that they weren't, <laughs> that their side wasn't completely without merit. Sure. Sure. And I would argue that, that, that Eisenhower was a very unifying figure. Now, yes, he did face divisions within his own party, but he was able to really uh, unify the American people in a very unique way. I think if he could have been reelected in 1960, he probably would have okay. successfully been elected for a third term uh, had the Constitution permitted it. Uh, but and also, I think his... Uh, uh, his consolidation of the New Deal, Fair Deal uh, policies, as you mentioned, uh, deserve a lot. He deserves a lot of credit there, too, making them more palatable to, to Republicans. Uh, and having, Her having Eisenhower as president with his stamp of approval, so to speak, uh, helped really uh, make them acceptable. And not to mention uh, the, the, the Cold War framework that he uh, strengthened as well. Uh, and I think Eisenhower deserves great credit for uh, at least uh, bringing some, maybe not ideal uh, ending to the war in Korea, but uh, a one that averted a third world war. Mm -hmm. That's a good string question, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, for that. It really is. Great question. Great question. All right. We were going to Richard okay. referring to the picture. Yes, Bess is in that is in that picture early in my presentation. Uh, if I'm thinking of the right one. <laughs> Excellent. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today and special thanks to Sam Ruscha and Tim Reeves for this excellent and informative presentation. The Truman Library Institute is selling commemorative bricks that will be installed outside of the stunning new entrance to the Truman Library. The big bricks start at $175 and they make excellent gifts for Truman fans. You can visit our website at trumanlibraryinstitute.org slash bricks, order yours today. To find more information about future programs commemorating the 75th anniversary of Truman's presidency, like the February programs listed here, be sure to follow the Truman Library Institute on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find Sam and Tim and the Truman and Eisenhower Libraries at trumanlibrary.gov and eisenhowerlibrary.gov. Thank you for joining us everyone tonight and thank you once again, Sam and Tim. I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you.